Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap. This one, probably the most fun news, is going to be Red Dead Redemption 2's PC requirements coming out. They're lower than you might expect, but there have been a lot of graphical updates that Rockstar's made to the game, and we have some details on those. Not a ton of screenshots yet, but they've posted some. Intel marketing needs work will be in the news as well. Uh, TSMC's new EUV process becoming commercially available, which is big news for the industry. And then Intel killing the KB Lake and KB Lake G series processors. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's Combo Deal. Right now, EVGA is offering a free CLC240 liquid cooler with the purchase of an X299 Dark motherboard from its web store. The X299 Dark has been our preferred Intel HEDT overclocking motherboard, and the CLC240 is a performance-oriented closed-loop liquid cooling solution. Both recipients have overall positive reviews from us previously. Use code GAMERSNEXUS at checkout to get a free CLC240 with the EVGA X299 Dark Motherboard at the link below. Last week, Rockstar finally out of the news that its Red Dead Redemption 2 title will be coming to PC about a year after the console launch. We covered that in the news roundup for last week and talked about some of the basics, so plans for graphical improvements. But now we have some PC requirements, and they're not all that intensive. Uh, that said, we do have some initial details as well on the graphical improvements and can go through some of those. So starting with the graphics updates, Rockstar says that the PC update will include increased draw distance, higher quality global illumination, ambient occlusion improvements for both day and night cycles, increased shadow resolution at quote all draw distances, increased reflection quality, uh, tessellated tree textures which will help fake better 3D appearance, and then this is all accompanied by what Rockstar says is, quote, improved grass and fur textures for added realism in every plant and animal. And that's all on the company's website. They've got some screenshots on their website as well, and we'll go through some of those to give you a bit of detail on it. Uh, further additions, though, did include a note for HDR and multi-monitor support. There was, uh, quote, faster frame rates. We don't know exactly what that means. Probably this is going to be the same frame rate behavior as with GTA 5. There might be some changes to the engine, but uh, it's still ultimately rage for the engine. And GTA 5 has a cap at about 187.5 FPS. For whatever reason, that last one is split. But we'll probably see the same. There's no word on exactly where it'll be capped or if it will be at all, but it's supposed to be higher than console, so that's at least good. We would uh, also assume that Rockstar may have looked into some of the weird frame issues we saw with for example, i5 CPUs previously, but we'll have to see when, uh, when Red Dead comes out. So specifications, the minimum specs say Windows 7, Service Pack 1, uh, processor is as Intel i5 2500K or an AMD FX 6300, so pretty low processor requirements at the minimum end. Memory, 8 gigabytes for system memory. Video card, they're minimally requiring a GTX 770, 2 gigabyte or AMD R9 280, 3 gigabyte. Hard drive space is 150 gigabytes. And then for recommended, they're saying Windows 10, April 2018 update, so 1803, an i7-4770K or AMD R5-1500X, 12 gigabytes of system memory recommended, and then a graphics card recommendation of a 1066 gigabyte or AMD RX 480, 4 gigabyte, hard drive space recommended at 150 gigabytes. Uh, so a lot of hard drive space, some of that might be to leave room for future patches. Rockstar does add a lot to its games with age, as you look at GTA 5, for example. The rest of it, though, is pretty low tier, so we're not sure what settings these will be specified for playing. It, hopefully, it would be something like 1080 low, because we would like to see a lot of graphical headroom there for improvements uh, to create a real benchmark at the high end as well. So we'll see. The good news is that both sets of specs do appear to be pretty accessible for most people, and the game, with its command for 150 gigabytes of storage, will uh, have some, some potential for maybe higher res texture packs or things like that later on. So anyway, uh, finally, there's also a note for widescreen configuration support, but we don't know if that means ultra wide or not. Uh, some of you may be looking for that though. Next up, Intel's marketing needs work, the sequel. We've talked about this before, but Intel and its marketing has returned as successfully demonstrated via tweet this past week. Uh, we just recently called into question Intel's marketing choices when it touted a new real-world benchmarks or realistic workload benchmarks at IFA, and also for making subtle digs at AMD with its frequency boosting issues with Ryzen 3000. AMD's fixed a lot of those, by the way. We've also recently criticized AMD for the same thing, although most of this was done 
privately to try and get the, the two companies. We sent both of them emails and said, uh, hey, guys, we need to talk. You guys, you, you need to stop bickering and fighting and act like good siblings to each other. So the problem here, AMD we criticized for the same type of thing. It was taking subtle stabs at NVIDIA, basically, with the RX 5500 announcement that we'll be talking about briefly today. AMD was saying that uh, unlike some people, it doesn't bifurcate its features, those are their words, and uh, doesn't have any artificial segmentation, except actually AMD does have artificial segmentation by admission of AMD to us at a press event on record. Uh, and that artificial segmentation is overclocking support, imposing restrictions at the high end for the RX 5700 non-XT. So anyway, the point is both companies do the same thing, and it's silly to try and stab each other over it because you just end up looking bad when someone proves you wrong. Intel's next on the list, though, and that was for this quote. The tweet was, the chip that hits frequency benchmarks as promised. Our new Core X series processor provides a stable, high-performance platform for visual creators everywhere. So Intel in this way is sort of subliminally trying to spin a thread that boost frequency and stability on AMD Ryzen processors are somehow related when stock, and they're really not. Intel's implying that reaching the promised boost speeds equates to stability in some way, casting AMD in a light that's not exactly accurate. That said, AMD has had issues with boosting, and they were a problem, and we covered them really heavily with a lot of content pieces. But I guess all we're really saying is this begs a simple question of why can't multi-billion dollar companies market the products they make based on the merits of those products rather than based on functionally negative attack ads on their competitors. So you walk away from it not knowing what the new product actually does. All you do is remember what the competing product has trouble with. So you don't really have an understanding of the value of the new product, which we think is bad marketing. It probably is sadly effective uh, because it, it seems to be the, the current uh, trajectory of marketing right now where everything devolves into thinly veiled mudslinging at each other because the internet goes, ha, 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 this is amazing. But we shouldn't really reward that behavior. So anyway, Intel's marketing needs work part two. We actually have to interrupt this news video with an update. After we filmed this video and section, but before publishing, Intel actually deleted its tweet that we had retweeted and flagged as childish earlier. We're happy to see that the company has rethought its subtle stabs, especially seeing as Intel isn't really in a position to joke about misleading frequencies. Intel, after all, is the same company that used a chiller to hit 5 gigahertz at a Computex event, but somehow forgot to mention anywhere that it was overclocked or on a chiller. Anyway, we're glad to see that Intel has taken feedback seriously, and we hope to see continued improvements in marketing products on their own merits. It's a glass house, after all, and holes can easily be poked into these jabs from all of the vendors, so hopefully everyone can learn from this. TSMC's N7 Plus EUV process is now commercially available. We've been talking about some of this for a little while, too, in news videos, and now TSMC's N7 Plus process that uses EUV on a few critical layers entered volume production back in May, but TSMC is reporting that the N7 Plus process is entering high volume uh, commercial availability as of this past week. This means that TSMC's N7 Plus customers should be shipping devices soon. Huawei is using TSMC's N7 Plus for its newest Kirin 990 5G SoC, and AMD will use the process for its Zen 3-based Ryzen chips. Apple is also using some variant of the N7 process for its latest A13 SoC. TSMC stated that N7 Plus is the company's fastest maturing process and is already matching yields of the N7 process. N7 Plus should net a 15% to 20% increase in density and around a 10% reduction in power consumption. TSMC is also on track to get its N6 process or 6 nanometer into risk production early next year with clients taping out chips by the end of 2020. TSMC's N6 will see the use of EUV in even more layers and should eventually reduce manufacturing costs and complexity. Back in 2017, we reported on when hell froze over. You might remember when Intel and AMD worked together on actually this, the one of the NUCs, where it's got a combination of Intel and AMD parts on it for what was actually a, a very good product. We, we liked the, uh, the Hades Canyon stuff a lot when we were working with it. So 
unfortunately, it's dead. And Intel and AMD minted a partnership in 2017 to collaborate on this new mobile chip design. AMD hadn't really yet begun pushing on Ryzen all that hard. And so it was pretty distant from being as competitive with Intel as it is today. Things have changed, though, in the market. So the partnership would usher in the KB Lake G parts. It ultimately suffered from adoption issues among OEMs. There were a handful of devices from Dell and HP that sported one of the KB Lake G parts, and Intel's own Hades Canyon NUC would make use of the ambitious chip design. However, KB Lake G required complicated custom cooling solutions from OEMs that fattened both the development cycles and the costs. And KB Lake G also shipped with 65 watt or 100 watt TDP parts, which limited the chips in terms of devices it could be embedded in. Neither of these factors helped encourage broader market uptake for KB Lake G, despite the impressive performance. And then you factor in Intel's new focus on graphics with its XE graphics architecture, the insatiable demand for 14 nanometer Intel Silicon compounded with that, and AMD's own competitive resurgence. It becomes clear that there's little room left for AMD and Intel to continue any form of partnership. That said, Intel is taking orders for KB Lake G up until January 31st, 2020. Final orders will ship by July 31st of 2020. Unsurprisingly, Intel also issued a PCN or product change notification for KB Lake SKUs, the first successor to Skylake. KB Lake largely saw a tepid response as it was very iterative as an upgrade. KB Lake's biggest gifts were in the Intel Pentium line, like the G4560 in particular, which we worked with a lot here at GN. Intel will take orders until April 24th, 2020 and ship those by October 9th, so about a year from now. But uh, so long to KB Lake and thanks for all the fish. Next gen, Threadripper may not be intercompatible between old and new. This one's in the rumor category. Let's get that out of the way first. So Tech Reporter Revolution on Twitter noted in confirmation of earlier rumors that uh, it's their understanding that AMD's TRX40 chipset may not feature compatibility with the first two rounds of Threadripper, the 19 and the a 2000 series, and that existing X399 motherboards also might not work with Threadripper 3. So if you have an X399 board you'd like to carry forward, we'll see, but the current rumor is that it won't work with the new generation of CPUs. So this has been rumored for the past week or so. It's gotten more confirmation from other technical media. We haven't yet independently verified this story. It's starting to look like it's got some support behind it, though. Uh, we'll wait and see what happens with it. AMD dropping the R9 3900 non-X and R5 3500 and X over the past couple, uh, two weeks or so for OEMs and SI customers. So AMD quietly confirmed the rumored R9 3900 and R5 3500 X, albeit the chips will only appear, presently at least, in pre-built systems with OEMs. When speaking with AMD at CES earlier this year, the company noted to us that its weakest point was in collaboration with system integrators, or SIs, and that would be working on improving that over the this year, and that's what part of this feeds into. The R9-3900 is still 12 cores, 24 threads, but unlike its XSKU counterpart, the 3900 will run uh, base and boost frequencies of 3.1 gigahertz and 4.3, respectively. The 3900 will also come with a 65-watt TDP, although more on that number in a, an upcoming video from us. and. The 3500X is rated for a base of 3.6, boost of 4.1, and it's got a, a similar set of specs to the R5 3600. However, the 3500X will lack SMT, critically, meaning that you're cutting the cores, or the threads rather, in half for the same amount of cores. You're at six core, six thread for that one, similar to the i5-9400F that Intel released. The 3900 will be available globally by OEM partners, and the 3500X is limited to a China-only launch. AMD's new RX 5500 GPUs will launch first with OEM or SI products, but should reach wider markets shortly. We don't yet have firm availability for retail cards and DIY for the new RX 5500 that was discussed in the past week. The specs are listed as follows, though. The 5500 OEM model will have 22 compute units, down from 36 on the 5700, and will run a game clock of 1717 megahertz, also known as boost clock to every normal human. But boost clock on AMD means the, what do they call it? The, the, the peak opportunistic boost, which can happen for something like milliseconds, or maybe even one of them. Anyway, the number that matters is 1717 megahertz and 22 CUs. Memory capacity should be four and eight gigabyte options with an advertised board power of 150 watts. It's still seven nanometer Navi, but it's called Navi 14 instead of Navi 10. And then 
price and release are TBD. Up next, researchers can now reverse engineer a chip much easier. Researchers and scientists from Switzerland and California have furthered their previous technique for imaging a chip known as Tychographic Computed Tomography with an upgrade known as Tychographic X-ray Laminography. Not really, not 100% sure on the pronunciation of Tychographic. This process allows for the essential reverse engineering of a chip, of which uh, carries a few different implications. So X-ray laminography is currently the first and only non-destructive method of reverse engineering chips or integrated circuits. Previously, layers of the chip or the circuit would have to be cut back. The new technology allows for precise imaging and zooming, and according to the inventors of the process, it can be used to ensure design integrity by identifying manufacturing deviations. It can also be used to identify potential security issues. As Tom's Hardware points out, this could obviously also be used by competition to analyze each other's products and uh, potentially try to advance technology at a, a faster pace. We'll have a technical breakdown of this linked in the show notes below if you'd like to read a lot more of the technical details behind the process. Finally, PCIe 5. Uh, discussed at ARM TechCon 2019. The appearance of PCIe 5 solutions with demonstrations of new interconnects popped up at ARM TechCon, like with Compute Express Link or CXL, which we've talked about in recent weeks as being backed by companies like AMD and NVIDIA, among other major players in the space and in the CXL consortium. The tech demonstration showed 32 giga transfer per second per lane PCIe Gen 5 demonstrations with an FPGA board to drive the showcase. We're still a ways out from Gen 5, but CXL and CCIX will be important protocol development over the next few years. There's not much to talk about yet beyond this demonstration spotted by Anantech earlier this week, but if you'd like to see some photos and additional write-up from Anantech about it, you can check the link in the show notes. So that's it for the news this week. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe for more as always. Go to store.cameraxis.net to help us out directly, like by buying one of these shirts or one of the mod mats, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.